the Word of God together. I just want to say thank you so much for making me feel so very much at home here. Your hospitality is incredibly warm, your sense of generosity and openness, and the spirit of faith that you have is very evident and very clear. And it's, uh, it's great to be together, isn't it? It's great to celebrate being body together. And I think it's one of the most important things about taking this time out is that sense of togetherness, that sense of being together, of sharing meals together, of hearing people snoring in the room next door. That you get to know each other then, don't you? That, that, you know when people see you when you first just got up in the morning and your hair looks like this and you bump into them in the bathroom or something? And those times together are really, really precious. Let's pray and uh, we'll take it from there. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we get to be together. God, I thank you that you have... Uh, called us out together. Lord, I thank you for your church, your ecclesia, the called out people of God together sharing the same purpose. And Lord, we want to say that we want to be together for your kingdom. Father, we want to say that we know that we are stronger together. Amen. And Lord God, that we need one another. Amen. And so Lord, I want to pray that as I speak today, God, that your spirit would bring revelation to each of our hearts. Jesus, you said that you have given us the Holy Spirit so that he will lead us into all truth. And so Father, we pray today that your spirit would lead us into all truth. We pray that he would glorify Jesus in the preaching of the word and in the responses of our hearts. And Father, we pray Lord God, Lord, that your spirit would also use this time to empower us for witness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been started looking at Nehemiah yesterday. And uh, as a church leader, I go to a lot of leadership conferences. And uh, people often speak about Nehemiah being all about leadership. And uh, I have to say, I don't agree. I don't agree. I don't think. Nehemiah speaks so much of leadership, but as the power of God's people together. You see, we can take a book like Nehemiah and we can focus on Nehemiah as the leader, but we do so at our peril because what Nehemiah speaks of is firstly God's grace in restoring his people, but secondly of what God is able to achieve when his people work together. And we live in a culture that wants to, uh, uh, you know, to put on the, a pedestal, the famous or the influential. But the point of church is not the famous or the influential, but it is God's called out people who work together. You know, Paul, when he writes, he says, not many of you were, were noble and uh, of influence. And actually, the gospel is good news to ordinary people. And the power of the gospel is that God changes lives and called out, calls out a people who together bring change. And I want to encourage you that your strength is not in your talent as individuals, although there are so many talented individuals in this room. Your strength is a call, as a called out people together. Your strength is your unity. And here's another one. Your strength is your difference. The fact that you have different cultures, different ages, that is a strength. And God wants to use you together to accomplish His work. And so I really want you to be mindful of that. That as I speak today, I'm going to speak about some of the challenges and the hurdles that God's people had to go through to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But what I want us to understand, these were not individual challenges. These were corporate challenges. These were challenges for the body together. And I believe even some of the individual challenges we face would be transformed if we would realize our need for others. You see, when uh, uh, in, uh, in, in John, in 1 John, when it talks about uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus trans uh, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And I love that sense of, of what you see there. If we as Christians walk in the light of Christ as he is in the light, 
What does it say? We have fellowship. Fellowship. Not just friendship. Not high and by. Not a casual greeting. Not just a handshake at the end of church. But we have fellowship. Koinonia. We have a heartfelt relationship together. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. In other words, part of walking in the light of Jesus means walking in the light with others. And as we share Christ together, the light of Christ reflects off of us, of each of us, and we walk together, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I really believe that one of our problems sometimes as Protestant believers is we don't take confession seriously enough. We almost respond to the Catholic thing by... Um, by becoming very individualized. And I think it's really important, I've learned this, to have someone close in your life that you can confess your sin to. Not so that they can give you uh, forgiveness, because that comes only from Christ, but so many times the things that we struggle with, if we would open up, if we want to walk in the light of Christ, actually, walking in the light means we have fellowship with one another. And I don't think we will ever truly walk in the light without opening our lives to others. You know, there's a, there's a very simple illustration from nature. I grew up in a flat that uh, had cockroaches in. Does anybody, mm. Cockroaches are very nasty things. And what would happen on if you turned on the light in the night, you'd see the cockroaches, but when the light came on, they would run for cover. And you know, some Christians, and I see, say this respectfully, are like cockroaches. God shines his light, convicts us, brings something where he wants us to change. And rather than walking in the light so that people can see all our flaws and frailties and difficulties, we choose to run for cover. And I want to encourage you, let's not be like that. Let's rather be like a moth. You know when you turn the lights on and the moths just come to the light? I believe that that's how church should be. You know, you turn the light on, the light who is Christ, and we gather together into the name of Jesus. We gather around the light. And, you know, in the light, you see everything. You know, sometimes when you wake up in the morning and you're not looking your best, then uh, you want to be in the darkness, don't you? But then when you see the light, it exposes all of your flaws. You know, if you've got a high-definition television, you can see every, um, every facet of someone's face. And I believe the light of Christ wants to illuminate us so that we walk in the light together. Nehemiah, I believe, understood that. As we looked yesterday at Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah 2, as Nehemiah goes for a walk on the walls, as he sees the difficulty, as he sees how burnt up it is and broken down, he inspires the people and he says, come, let us build. The interesting thing is the very next verse says the people responded to Nehemiah and they say, come, let us build. In other words, Nehemiah had a vision from God, but he knew that that wasn't for him, but that was for God's people together. And in order to accomplish it, it would have been no use for Nehemiah to say, I've got a vision, let me get my bag of tools out and to start building a wall. He would have been there for years and years and years and nothing would have happened. But straight away he harnesses, it begins with a few, but he begins to harness the power of together. Nehemiah harnesses God's people, he communicates vision, and he invites others to join him in his work. And so as we said yesterday, Nehemiah is often famed for building the wall, but in reality Nehemiah built very little, but God's people together built the wall. Nehemiah provided leadership. We need leadership. But uh, as a body of Christ, we need to learn fellowship. And we need to learn what it is to walk together in the service of God. And I want to encourage you that all the vision and plans and, 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 and you know, strategic plan and all the, the things that sit in our hearts, they all depend on us working together. It's never ever just about you or I as individuals, but it's about the power 
of being together as the body of Christ. And that is such an important thing. And I want to encourage you in this weekend, make friends with somebody you don't know. Make a purposeful choice to find someone from a different culture than you and say, can we have a cup of coffee together? Maybe take the opportunity to get to know them a little bit and then at the end say, why don't you come to my house to eat? Now I'm sure with the varying cultures here, we'll probably have a competition as to who is the best food. But uh, I have to tell you, Bengali fish curry is the, is the best food that you will ever eat. So, so you can have a competition for the second best food. But the, um, the important thing is, maybe connect with somebody who is different from you. Make that one of your goals over this weekend. And then you'll see a new dimension of together. Let's, uh, but let's look at some of those oppositions and challenges. You see, because God's people had to face very, very distinct challenges to fulfill his purposes. They had to deal with some uh, opposition, which I think is symptomatic of what happens to all churches. So they had to deal with discouragement, disunity, distraction, and distress. Now I've been pastoring for about 20 years now, and I want to tell you that those things are the day-to-day -day of human existence. They're the day-to-day -day of church life that we need to learn how to, dis how to deal with discouragement, distraction, disunity, and distress. Not just as individuals, but we need to learn how to do it together as church. Because if we want to achieve something significant, if we want to be involved in building God's work, we have to persevere. And it takes commitment. Have you ever thought about, you know, in the military, they give medals for people who do extraordinary things. They don't just hand out the medal for showing up. Um, but for doing extraordinary things. And James says the same thing, doesn't he? You know, he talks about the crown of life when you go through trials. In, in, in James and then in Revelation, we read of the crown of life. You know, to him who has persevered comes the crown of life. And the uh, Bible tells us that Jesus was perfected through suffering. Not that he was morally imperfect, but the perfection was shown to be true through suffering. In other words, difficulty comes our way to make us more Christ-like. Difficulty comes our way so that God perfects us through it. But that means commitment. Because many people run when things get tough. Or they become isolated or they hide away. And uh, as, a, as a body of Christ, God is calling you to commitment. Now, there's a difference between involvement and commitment. I don't know if you know the story of the pig and the chicken. So the pig and the chicken are walking down the street, and they see a sign saying, bacon and eggs, £2.50. <laughs> and the chicken turns to the pig, and he says, I sure am involved with that breakfast. And the pig looks at him and says, yes, but with me, it's total commitment. <laughs> and uh, as Christians, we need to move from involvement in church to commitment. We need to move from being around the things of God to being committed to God's purposes. And that means dealing with discouragement, disunity, distraction, and distress. So let's read from Nehemiah uh, chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. Um, I'll give you a moment. It should come up on the screen there, hopefully. Now it came about that when Sambala heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and of wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer their sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dust, even dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him and said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. Hear, O oh our God, how we are despised. 
return their reproach on their heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their inequity and let not their sin be blotted out before thee, for they have demoralized the builders. So we built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now it came about when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashadites heard that the repairs of the walls to Jerusalem went on, and that the breaches began to be closed. They were very angry, and all of them conspired together to come to fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance. You know, this passage shows us that when God's people start to come together under a vision. They begin to build. So that it, one of the incredible things is that Nehemiah galvanizes and utilizes this whole community of people to begin to build the wall. But when God starts blessing, how many of us know the devil starts messing? And so as God starts blessing, the enemy comes in and wants to discourage the builders. And the truth is that for us, as we are faithful to Christ, as we go about doing what he's called us to do, we are going to face opposition. Jesus was really clear with his disciples that they would face opposition. Paul says, doesn't he, when he says goodbye to the Ephesian elders, he says that I know that the Holy Spirit testifies of opposition and difficulties and hardships awaiting me. And then he says, but I count my life worth nothing. So long as I complete the task that God has given me. And so the Holy Spirit was even speaking to Paul and saying, opposition lies ahead. And I want to encourage you, and it is an encouragement, that as you fulfill the calling and purposes of God on you as a church, you will face opposition. And those tests will allow God to perfect you as a body, will allow him to build a real sense of community, and will ensure that Jesus is glorified in you and through you. And the good news is you don't face it alone, but you face opposition and difficulty together. You know, in their case, primarily the opposition that was spoken was that they faced was opposition of the man. It was spoken. It was threats. It began with mocking. You know, we read in that passage, don't we? They say, they're, what they're doing is so feeble. Even if a fox jumped on it, then the walls would break down. The, the enemy comes in and they begin to mock what God is doing. They begin to try to discourage what God is doing. They begin to try to distract that verse, how feeble, verse 2, are, is what the Jews are building. In other words, they, the enemy comes in and says, what you are doing is of no significance. You know, I, I think that that's a, a lie that the opposition uses. For many of us, we are often held captive by thoughts of insignificance. We are held captive of thinking that it makes no difference. You know, I don't know about you, but there may be times when you're tempted to lie in bed on a Sunday and not come to church and thinking it will go on without me. And I want you to know that church would not be the same without you. When you miss church, you don't just miss hearing, but you deprive others of what you bring. You see, church is the called out people of God. And it really wouldn't be the same without any one of you. And so what we have to realize is church is not about what we uh, receive just. But church is the place where we come to give, where we come to share our talents, where we come to encourage others. And so much of the time the enemy holds us captive by saying that your contribution is worth nothing. And the enemy wants to hold you in discouragement because it is such a powerful weapon. None other than Billy Graham himself says God cannot use a discouraged Christian. Because when we are discouraged, we allow the thoughts of the enemy to be stronger than the truth of God's word. We allow something else to obstruct what God wants to do. You know, we had the eclipse last week, didn't we? 
And I believe that's, that's such a great picture of discouragement. Because what happens with an eclipse is that the moon gets in the way of the sun. Now the moon is infinitely smaller than the sun, but just for a few moments, it seems like the moon is bigger. Because when the circumstances align correctly, the moon blots out the sun. And what happens is everything seems dark. And the truth is the sun is so much bigger and so much brighter than the moon. But for those small moments, because of the alignment, you can only see darkness. And that's how discouragement is. The truth is that Jesus is alive, that he's placed his Holy Spirit into you, that he has a purpose for you, that he has a plan for you, that he's, you are made in the image of God and you are precious and priceless and unique and you have a calling on your life. But someday, sometimes, it feels that all you can see is darkness. And you know, it's so easy to allow the Son, S-O-N, Jesus, to be obscured by the moon of discouragement. And you know what that's about is simply about alignment. As the earth begins, as the, the alignment changes, so the perspective changes. And it's the same with us. If we want to come out of discouragement, we often have to change our perspective. We have to look differently and see that although this problem seems so big, the sun Jesus is so much bigger. And I want to encourage you, do not be discouraged. Do not allow discouragement to grip you. Do not allow discouragement to disqualify you from the call and purposes of God. It's the voice of the enemy that says, if they only knew what you were like, and we want to hide. It's the voice of the enemy that says, look at your past, look at your thoughts, look at your sins. And that's why we have to take every thought captive and make it subject to Christ. Because otherwise we allow ourselves to be discouraged. And what we see is that Nehemiah sees the discouragement and he takes action. Firstly, if we follow that passage through, we see that Nehemiah prays. Nehemiah's first response to discouragement and discouragement in others is to pray. He doesn't, his, his response isn't to defend himself, but it is to pray. And I want to say to us that it's really important that we learn to take our burdens to God. When we feel discouraged, to call out to God. We read of David, that David encouraged himself in the Lord. And one thing I look for in leaders, when I'm looking to choose leaders, I look for who is able to encourage themselves in God. Because there are times when somebody may not or will not come to encourage us in our time of need. And at that point, we have to realize that Hebrews says that we find grace and mercy in our time of need. But who is the anchor for our souls? Christ. And the hallmark of a leader is that they are able to encourage themselves in the Lord. So I really want to, to leave that with you, that to, to be a leader and to function in the, in the kingdom of God, one of the things you have to learn to do is to encourage yourself. You know, we see that in the psalmist, doesn't he? He says, you know, why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? And then he says, trust in God. And I want to say to you that, uh, that one of the things that God wants to do in us is give us the ability to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Not in ourself, not in our flesh. When the enemy criticizes us, you know, in some senses, it's fine to agree with that and say, but in Christ, then I am new. And Nehemiah prays, he takes it back to God. But also Nehemiah takes a sober assessment. As we follow the narrative through, Nehemiah looks at the walls and he sees the points of vulnerability and he decides to strengthen them. And I think that that's a good spiritual practice and discipline in our life to take a sober assessment of our lives, see the points of vulnerability 
and choose to strengthen them. If you know you have a weakness in a certain area, then bring change to that. There's a story of a man, he said he told his friend he broke his arm in four places. His friend said, stay out of those places. <laughs> and I, I want to say to you, if you know that there are situations and circumstances that kill the work of God in your life, if it's friendships or habits or, or television programs, anything that has the work of discouraging you and discouraging the work of God in you, strengthen those areas. You know, don't go to places that are causing you to uh, sin and to stumble. If there are things that distract from the work of God in your life, deal with them. Nehemiah looks at the points of vulnerability. One of the things that I think is really important in our lives is to be aware of our points of weakness. So I have a, um, a, a great team of elders at our church. They are fantastic people. But you know, the first half an hour of all of our elders meetings isn't business. And it's, it's simply what we do for the first half an hour is we talk about our lives. How are you doing? What are you facing? Because you know what? I want us to have an authentic team. From there we go to a place of prayer and only then do we do the business stuff. And my leadership team know my weaknesses and my frailties. They know the things that I struggle with. And it's so important that if we are going to strengthen our places of vulnerability, that firstly we know we have self-awareness, we know what our weaknesses are, and we put proactive plans in place to see them change. And that is so important. If you know you have an area of weakness in your life, ask someone to hold you accountable for it. Begin to share, begin to create culture. And you know what you do? When you share what you find difficult, very often somebody shares what they find difficult and we begin to create reality. We begin to create koinonia fellowship and we begin to see grace changing. We walk in the light together as he is in the light. And we begin to see victory and freedom and change. So be honest with others. It's a, it's a real part. Nehemiah saw the points of vulnerability and he dealt with them. Next, he encouraged the people. He encouraged the people. You know, if you want a ministry at church, be an encourager. There's always room on that team. You know, you may want to be on a different team, but I tell you, the team where there's always space and it's always needed in every church is the encourager. Those who come to church, who made a decision that they come to encourage others. You know, I have a guy in my church, uh, his name is Steve, he comes from a very broken background, crazy family, uh, all the family of, were very involved in, uh, in crime and all sorts of things, very tough family background, he uh, was raised in, a, in, in an orphanage, and a very difficult life. He became a Christian uh, in, in, the, in his 30s, he's a transformed man now. He, he's, he can hardly write English, English, but he's very illiterate, struggles to be able to read the Bible, uh, but finds it difficult, but really makes an effort with it. Uh, doesn't, writing doesn't come naturally to him. But if I took my phone and you would see the amount of encouraging text message he sends. He prays for people, reads the Bible, and is always sending scriptures to someone saying, I was thinking about you today, I was praying about you. And if a man who struggles to read can do that, then you or I can do that. We can be people who encourage, people who call someone up and just say, we missed you today. People who, who uh, what does it mean to be an encourager? It means to speak Courage. An encourager literally gives courage. They say, God is for you. They say, I like the way you did that. They tell you that God has his purposes, that God's grace abounds towards you. And they are people who give and speak courage. And Nehemiah does that. He goes and he speaks courage to the people. Chapter 4, verse 14 says, When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. This is what he says to them. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. 
and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your houses. Firstly, he encourages them, not with their own strength, but with God's strength. He says, remember the Lord. And friends, when you're going through a tough time, and when difficulty comes as you step out in the purposes of God, and opposition comes, remember God. Remember God. Remember that the sun is bigger than the moon of discouragement. That the sun has risen with healing in his wings. Remember that God is greater than the difficulties we face. And, and Nehemiah wants the people, the basis of all encouragement is to remember who God is. You know, in James, again, James 1, he says, count it pure joy when you go through trials of every kind. How do we count it pure joy? It doesn't mean that we, we, have a, we find pleasure in difficulty, but it means we know the higher truth, that beyond our struggles, the truth is God is good. And God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And so I want to encourage you, be encouragers. Then he stirs them up to work and he says, fight for your families. You know, for some of you, you've got family situations that are difficult. Friends, don't sit in despair, but begin to intercede. Begin to pray. Begin to pray because prayer changes not God, it changes us. Prayer changes our perspective. I'd encourage you to take time to fast. Again, fasting doesn't twist the arm of God. Fasting changes my own heart. It's, a, it's, the, way, it's the primary way in the, New Te in the Bible where Christians humble themselves is to pray and to fast. And fasting doesn't change God, but it does change us. And if you, in a situation, in a battle situation, begin to pray, begin to intercede, take time to fast. But also as that happens, Nehemiah gets a strategy. And as he begins to strengthen the walls, he, he just also has this strategy, though, of tools and weapons. And he, he allocates the people. He says, right, some of us need to stand as guardians and watchmen on the walls. And others will work and the rest will guard. And then it says as we follow the passage through that some of them they worked with a tool in one hand and a sword in the other. And I believe that's a beautiful picture of the church. That we have different gifts and responsibilities but we need each other. That as we are busy building and working we need the intercessors, those who make war in the heavenly realms. We need those who will uh, take up the armor of God. And it's so important, brothers and sisters, to realize that they would be protected by God through one another and through one another having different functions. It's the beauty of church. We are not all called to be the same or do the same. But we do need the contributions of all of us. And there is this sense in which they are called to build, but also to battle. They are called to the tools to dig and to build a wall, but also they are called to the tools of warfare. And we're reminded that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but we wage war in the heavenly realms. And brothers and sisters, if we're going to build something with God in our community, we need to be people of prayer. And that sense of prayer and practicality, of action and intercession, they are what characterize healthy churches. See, some churches just do and do and do, and they achieve nothing because they've lost the art of prayer. They've lost the presence and intimacy of God. And others spend all their time praying, but do nothing and leave no impact because they've ceased to be able to function in a practical way. And as church, I believe that to overcome the opposition of discouragement, that you need to be people who are practical and spiritual. People of intercession and people of action. People of prayer and practicality. 
and God will use you together. And so Nehemiah begins to organize, and it takes organization and leadership to give legs to it. And that's why we need leadership. We need to learn what it is to follow, to work together in the purposes of God. But that tool of discouragement that the enemy wants to use, brothers and sisters, together you are able to fight it. When there is discouragement among you, it's really important that we have our eyes open and are ready to encourage one another. Encourage one another. You know, when someone is down, the power of putting an arm around them, sometimes not even to give them solutions, but just to say, brother, I'm with you. I love that song we were singing around the campfire yesterday. It really, uh, it really summarizes this message in some senses. You know, don't give up. You are loved. There's someone who loves you. I love the idea that we sung it not just to God, but to one another. And, and put an arm around somebody. Hug them. Tell them you're wanted. You're needed. You have a place in this church. You have a place in the body of Christ. And I believe that's so important that to overcome opposition and to deal with the discouragement is to have encouragers. Make it, diarize it in your diary. Find ways this week to be an encourager. There's so many discouragers. I don't know if you have them at church. We have a couple in our church. There are a few of them who, when they come, you just think, I know it's going to be bad news. <laughs> and it's fine to go through a difficult season, but there are some people who seem to, to live in discouragement. And friends, be an encourager. Be somebody who encourages others. Secondly, Nehemiah had to deal with disunity. As they began to build, friction arises. You know, busy people bump into one another. You know, if you do nothing then you'll never have a collision. And uh, the only place where you have to make no effort to get to in life is the cemetery. You know, really, somebody else will take care of it. You just do the dying, someone else will take you to the cemetery. But everything else in life takes effort. And people that move around bump into one another. And in a healthy church, we have to understand that a level of conflict is normal. And the level of conflict is normal because it speaks of passion. Within a marriage, there will be conflict at times because two different people who think differently, experience differently, let alone how women think. But they, uh, so naturally, there's a level of conflict. And conflict can be good if we learn from it. You know... In a very practical level, you know, some of the difficulty that we have helps us to learn what is important to someone, doesn't it? When you have a conflict with them, you learn if you understand why did it happen? Because this person is passionate about this and I trod on it. And it can be a healthy thing. And, and so we have to understand that a level of conflict within a busy church is normal. But we should never get into disunity. And as they began to build the walls, disunity came. And in, you know, if we look at Nehemiah 5, we don't really have time to look at it now, but Nehemiah 5, 6 to 11, we see that it arose because of usury. So what was happening is because they were busy building the wall, they were going through a tough time, finances were tough, and some people thought, right, this is a great opportunity. They're busy building the work of God. I can exploit them. So I can say, okay, I'll lend you some money. I'll lend you £10, but you give me back £30. And if not, you'll lose everything. And so they took advantage of the hard work of others and began to, to exploit it. And so the people, what happens is disunity comes because of selfishness and sin. And the truth is, for all of us, that's always how disunity comes. At the heart of every element of disunity, there is selfishness and sin which causes it. And to, deal, to be effective as a body, we have to deal with disunity. If the enemy cannot discourage you, 
He will try to disunify you. He will try to get you to speak against one another. He will try to get you to gossip. He will try to get you to slander one another. He will try to get you to argue with one another. Because the enemy knows that in disunity, then he is able to succeed. And as believers who want to build the work of God, we have to be committed to grace and to forgiveness. Martin Luther, the reformer, said of, uh, um, and, and he was a monk who married a nun, and that doesn't happen very often. So if you get marriage advice from a monk who married a nun, you should listen. And he said, he said that marriage is the uh, school of character, but he also said it's a union of two great forgivers. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because within the body of Christ, we need to learn to be generous with our forgiveness. To not take offense. To not assume the worst. Even if we challenge someone's action, let's try not to challenge their intention. So to say to them, you did this and it wasn't good is one thing. But to say, you deliberately did this or you... And if someone challenges your actions, you can live with it. You can change. When they challenge your intention, you've got nowhere to go. And as the body of Christ, we need to be generous with our forgiveness. We need to think of others more highly than ourselves. We need to esteem one another. We need to prefer one another. And that's tough. But that's how we deal with disunity. Disunity says, if I have something in my heart against my brother, I go work it out with him. I ask for his forgiveness. If I think he has something against me, I say, brother, let's work this out together. And it's so important to build the work of God that we deal with disunity. Don't allow the seeds of it. Because like anything, disunity starts with a seed. A seed of offense. We may not say anything, but we're offended. Now, it's really interesting. As a leader, people can get offended that I didn't say good morning to them at church. You know, we have a hall full of people. I'm firstly looking out for the visitors and the new people. And uh, somebody could say, oh, and then you, you have a problem with them. And six months later, you realize it's because you didn't say good morning to them. I mean, we have to mature beyond that. <laughs> but most... Most offense comes from a small seed that was planted. And I believe that if we deal with the seeds, then we don't let them germinate, and we don't get the plant, and we don't get the root, and then we don't get the fruit. If we would uproot the seed when it falls. So we know someone's offended us. Pick up that seed and say, I choose to die to it. This is my brother and sister in Christ that I choose to think about the best, and I'm going to go bless them. You know, if somebody offends you, here's a really powerful thing. Do something nice for them. If there's somebody in your church who just, who annoys you, go bake them a cake. If you get <laughs> ten cakes next week, you need to look at your character. <laughs> but if there are, you know, find ways to bless them. If somebody offends you, begin to pray for them. Because as we pray for them, what does prayer do? Prayer changes our hearts. And we can't sit with offense. And very soon, we go from being against them to being for them. But it happens through making a conscious choice to not fall into disunity. And Nehemiah had to deal with it. But Nehemiah confronts it in, in uh, chapter 5, verse 9. He says, so I continue, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies. He says, I and me and my brothers are also lending the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give it back to them immediately. Give them back their fields, vineyards, olive groves, houses. Give them back the interest you are charging them. You see, Nehemiah realized that sometimes you have to confront wrongdoing. And one of the jobs of leadership is to change culture and it's to confront sin. And these people then were faced with an opportunity. Do they repent or do they fall into further disunity? 
And I want to say to you, when leadership of a church in the humble and godly and loving way challenges you, be open to change. I know it's never easy, but actually sometimes we need to hear that. Sometimes really the wounds of the friend are hard, but they really are necessary. Friends who will say to you, Brother, there's something going on here. The way you responded isn't right. Brother, this, this attitude needs to change. And Nehemiah confronted sin and it brought change. And, and really we have to be willing to be convicted. But he does it together. He calls them together. He wants them to understand this is an issue for all of them. So discouragement, disunity, and we see that when the enemy cannot discourage them, he starts to threaten and intimidate them, starts to try to bring disunity. And then when that works, he tries distraction. It's really interesting if you follow this story through, and please do take the time to do it. In chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Now it came about, it was reported to Sambalat, to Beer, to Gisham, the Arab, these were the people opposing the work, and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Then Sambalat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Cherifim in the plain of Ono, but they were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent messages to me four times in this manner, and I answered them in the same way. So they could not discourage, intimidate, and disunify the people. So what do they try to do? They try to distract them. And you know, within the body of Christ, distraction is a powerful tool. Because we live in a distracted age. I'm kind of half tempted to ask, you know, how many of you are tempted to even check your Facebook, Twitter, internet, during sermons, during your quiet time. It's so easy to be distracted, isn't it? You're praying and suddenly hear the, the tone on your phone. And actually what you're faced with then is, am I going to continue praying to the God of all heaven and earth? Or is this piece of technology, does that call my attention more than the God of heaven? And distraction is a powerful thing. Dis distraction even in the church. Distraction about the purpose of the church. So today we have churches that do so much social work, but don't preach the gospel. And social work even becomes an idol to the church, the social and community ministries. And we do that, but we ensure that the gospel is hardwired into it. Because otherwise, we can end up creating situations where we become distracted from the task. The task they were given was to build the wall. The task that you or I have been given is to go and to make disciples of all nations. We are not called just to build schools, hospitals, do so. Those things all come out of that and they are good things to do. But the prime call is to go and to make disciples. And if we do not make disciples, then actually we're disobedient and we're distracted. You know, Jesus, when he speaks about the, uh, the servant and the master, and he says, which one of you will the master find doing what he was left to do? And that's a powerful thing because we live in an age where the church has become distracted from preaching the gospel. And we have to make sure that we don't become distracted. You know, it's possible to do lots of good things, but ignore the best thing, which is to go and to make disciples. And it's such an important, important thing. Even, we you know, with church, so one of my big passions is world mission. Mission locally, nationally, internationally. And all of our mission work is based on the concept of least reach. We want to prioritize our time, money, and passion reaching the least reach. The fact is, and even within our own movement in the Assemblies of God, so much of our time and money into mission goes to most reached countries. 
Christian mission giving the world over is directed mostly to the already reached. Unreached people receive such a small part of our Christian giving. And that's because in one sense we become distracted. I read a stat from an American missions organization and it said this, Americans spend more every year on Halloween costumes for their pets than they do on reaching the unreached. That's a frightening statistic. They spend more money on Halloween costumes for their pets. I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> they spend more on that than reaching the unreached. Not in mission generally, but on money that goes to the unreached. And we need to realize that part of the distraction of our age is that we want to go where the crowds are. You know, I know that, you know, within our, our mission work, you know, come and hold a crusade in a country that's already so very, very reached, and then you get a nice picture of you with a big crowd, and, and it, it looks good on your church website. But actually, supporting church planters in a village just outside Calcutta, with people who are totally unreached, for me, that's more important than reaching the already reached. And I know, you know, it's, there's the calling of God in there, but it's really important that we don't become distracted from the task that we've been left with. There is a hurting, dying, broken world that needs to hear the good news of Jesus. And the good news for you is that lots of those people live in London, because London is an unreached city. Maybe 150 years ago it was reached, but it is now in many senses a post-Christian society. And friends, you know, you can get on the plane and go to Africa, but I tell you, there's more reached people in some of those places that traditionally we send missionaries to than you will find in Wimbledon or Kingston or places like that. And friend, God has called you to not get distracted. And that means having the fellowship of church, but not being in a bubble and not that we cannot become distracted to the point where we stop meeting and reaching non-Christians. If the church is going to grow, it's because you will not be distracted from the work. And Nehemiah had to ensure. So they said to him, they said to him, they tried to intimidate him, didn't work. They tried to discourage him, it didn't work. So what do they do? They say, come to a meeting. Come to a meeting. In other words, stop doing this important work and come to a meeting. And we know from the scripture they plan to harm him. And I love Nehemiah's response. Nehemiah says, I am engaged in a great work. Why should I become distracted? Verse 3, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. And I believe that when the enemy wants to distract you from what he's called you to, you need to answer similarly. And say, I'm too busy doing the work of God. When he calls you to selfishness or pride or disunity, say, I'm too busy. When he tries to distract you with things that fill up your time but are of no eternal significance, we need to learn from Nehemiah. You know, it says they invited him to the plane of Ono. I love that. So when the enemy tries to distract you, say, Oh no! Oh no, oh no, I'm not coming. Oh no, I'm not going to spend waste my time. Oh no, I'm not going to spend four hours just wasted in front of a screen playing a computer game. Life is short, brothers, sisters, and we will give an account for it. And our time is short. And friends, do not allow discouragement, disunity, or distraction to take you out of the will of God. And then lastly, distress. It's really interesting. They, um, um, if we read in chapter 6, verse 11. Nehemiah goes to see someone. And they, he tries to uh, say to Nehemiah, quick, let's flee into the temple. Because they're coming to get you, to kill you. And Nehemiah's response is incredible. He says, but I said, should a man like me flee? And could one such as I go into the temple to save his own life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that surely God had not sent him, but he utter, had uttered his prophecy against me because Sambiah and Tobiah had hired him. 
He was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act accordingly and sin, so that they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. You see, the enemy wants to place Nehemiah under threat and in distress. And sometimes the spirit of fear wants to come against us and to overwhelm us. And there are situations and difficult seasons in life. And friends, I want to tell you, do not fear. Do not fear. You know, in 2009, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I can remember that morning well when she found the lump in her breast. And she called the doctor. And being a good husband, I was saying, oh, it will be nothing. It be nothing. And we prayed and she just said to me, I think that God has spoken that this is cancer. And he said to me that he's going to deliver me through it rather than round it. And we went to the hospital and very quickly at Bart's they were able to check it out. And they realized that she had cancer and it was very serious. And, um, and this spirit of fear wanted to come in. And it wanted to discourage and distress and distract. And we were really faced with a choice. Faced with a, a scan which says, you've got cancer and this is very serious. And at that point, we had to make a choice. Where is our hope and where is our trust? And you know, it started off the course of a year, but we had the word of the Lord. And we knew that God said he was going to deliver us through it rather than around it. And you know what? In one sense, I'd love if we'd laid hands on her and she'd been instantly healed. And that would have been great. But the fact was, the word of the Lord is, I'm going to deliver you through it. And there are difficult times that will come. And God's grace is sufficient for us. At that point, my first thought was, how are we going to do this? We're leading a church. And you know, incredibly, within a week, some friends of ours who'd moved out to New Zealand, just built a nice house, big mortgage on it, they emailed and they said, um, just to let you know, we're going to move back to London for a year and uh, the wife, Becky, will just spend the year looking after Annie. And they're good friends of ours and they just said, we're going to quit our life in New Zealand, put it on hold for a year, come to London, he'll work. And she will just look after your wife that year. And God had a plan. I mean, you think, how can you earn that kind of friendship? And the truth is, you can't. But this is God's grace. And God had a plan. And then during that time, consistently, we saw difficulty, but we saw God's grace. She had an operation. So she had six months of chemotherapy. And then, uh, then she had an operation. And the operation went really badly. And they damaged her thoracic duct. And, uh, and it got very, very distressing. And she was already weak from the chemo. And they tried to do some surgery to repair it. And it, it just hadn't worked. And the doctor sat us down and said, this is very serious. She may die if this doesn't change. And we were faced with the choice. Do we fear or do we trust God? And the doctor said, there's one more operation we can do. But this is almost the last roll of the dice kind of thing. And I remember being with Annie and she said, God has spoken that he's going to heal me. And uh, so the doctor came in and he said, right, we need to do this operation on Thursday. And uh, Annie said, I think God's going to heal me. Fortunately, <laughs> the doctor was a believer. Now, he wasn't a charismatic believer. He said, yes, yes, I believe in God healing too, but he's going to heal through my surgeon's <laughs> and, uh And she said, no, no. I, and again, I'm not saying, please do go to the doctors. It's very important. Don't get me wrong. It's the grace of God and God uses them. But in this situation, and, and we just said, so I'm trying to put, convince Annie, saying, no, have the operation. And she said, God's going to heal me. So the doctor said, I'll tell you what, we'll leave it another three days. And if nothing happens... Then you have the operation. So, okay. Sensible, con sensible compromise. <laughs> On that third day, it just changed. Amen. It just changed. The, all the fluid that was coming out just stopped. Her body changed. God did something. What happened that weekend, just when that was going on, I'd, um, just before the change happened, we had a, a meeting of local churches together, some churches that we meet together, to pray and to fast and to seek God. 
And uh, one of the other pastors said, we want to pray for your wife tonight. And together we cried out. And then that next morning, my sister-in-law had come from Liverpool. And uh, she's the elder of a church in Liverpool. And she, at the time, she laid hands on my wife and prayed. And they just knew something was different. And then next day, the situation changed. The reason I say this is because that year was tough. And then on the back of that came a, a season of radiotherapy and then going for septin treatment. And so this, it was a, about 18 months. But you know, during that time, we grew closer to God than we have ever been. We grew closer in our friendships than we've ever known. And the church grew significantly during that time. The reason I'm saying this is because opposition comes. If we had tried to face that on our own, we would have been devastated. But we knew the fellowship of others, we knew the support, we knew the encouragement of God. And friends, in, in achieving things for God, opposition comes. And that's where we really, really need each other. Whatever it is you're going through today, whether it's a big thing or a small thing, God wants you to know that there are people in this room who love you and are for you. There are people who are standing with you. There are people who will commit their time to pray for you. They will visit and encourage you. There are people who want to stand with you together into the purposes of God. And what I want us to do is, if we can all just stand and, um, if, if the man can come and play a bit, we're, we're not going to ask for anybody. Let's continue to pray just one more time. Uh, responding to the Word of God uh, this morning. And I think I want to suggest uh, just a couple of things. Uh, let us try to be disconnected in terms of Wi-Fi, Internet, for today and tomorrow you can be somewhere fantastic like this and still try to connect Wi-Fi you know messenger cacao talk watch out whereas you have people around you you know uh, not really engaging not really talking not really listening and they cannot be right they cannot be right how would you make disciples of all nations without really knowing, getting to know people around you. And in the same church, in the same body of Christ, that cannot be wrong. So let's, let's respond to the word of God uh, this morning and just put the phone down, you know, put it in your bag, uh, in your pockets, somewhere. And it's great that the signal, or oh, your know, Wi-Fi signal is not that good here anyway. Okay, so let's be disconnected, all sorts, all, all, all of them, and be connected to one another. Secondly, I want to encourage us to uh, go to someone who, who you don't know well, okay? And we want to go to pray for each other. And so don't don't go to your wife, your husband, your children, your close friend, okay? Go to somebody you haven't really, you know, spoken uh, and don't know, okay? But this is a great opportunity. Maybe, maybe, you know, cross, cross the room and maybe I can force. Okay, so just sharing a prayer request. Why is it that, that, that he or she is somebody with at the moment? Prayer needs has really genuinely the spirit of interest and compassion. Okay, uh, and let's pray for them. Let's really hold our hands together. Maybe put your arms around and pray for each other. Shall we do that?